everything you ever wanted to know about cardiac physiology in one short video. Actually, what I'm going to do in this short video is just review the physiology that's most relevant to understanding ECGs, ECG interpretation, and very helpful in terms of assessing cardiac patients. So we'll talk about the cardiac cycle, preload and afterload, blood pressure, and more importantly, mean arterial pressure, neurological control of the heart, and the unique properties of cardiac cells. A cardiac cycle is the time frame from one contraction to the next. One complete cycle is the start of one contraction to the start of the next, and we typically look at and talk about ventricular contractions. The two terms that we use for these are systole and diastole. Systole is that simultaneous contraction of both ventricles, and diastole is the relaxation phase when the ventricles fill passively with about 70% of the forward blood movement falling basically as a result of gravity from the atria to the ventricles. At the end of diastole, you have a phenomenon called the atrial kick, which is when the atria contract near the end of that relaxation phase of the ventricles and move the rest of the blood from the atria into the ventricles. This gives you that forward movement of blood that's required to finish off that filling, if you will. This is significant in rhythms like atrial fibrillation, where the atria are just quivering rather than contracting, and the result is a drop of about 20 to 30 percent in cardiac output for those patients. As the heart reaches the end of diastole, we move into systole, and that is the actual contraction of the ventricles. And what happens as the ventricles begin to squeeze, the pressure closes the valves between the ventricles and the atria. The pressure then pushes open the valves, leading to the pulmonary artery and the aorta. That only takes place once that pressure within the ventricle exceeds the pressure within those vessels. And that's significant, especially as we talk in a minute about afterload. That's the pressure that has to be overcome in order to create cardiac output. When those ventricles contract, an important point to note is that not all of the blood in the ventricles moves forward. It's just not that efficient of a pump. What we know is that in a normal patient, a normal healthy heart, about 55 to 70 percent of the blood in the ventricle is pumped out of the ventricle with each contraction. And that's a equivalent to roughly 70 to 90 milliliters in an average adult patient. And obviously that can vary a little bit from patient to patient. And it's one of the things that we look at and measure in patients with congestive heart failure or with other cardiac myopathies to determine how bad the damage is. An important measurement is to know what percentage of the blood is actually being pumped out with each contraction. When we think about pressure and we look at the components that make up blood pressure, there's a few things that we need to think about. And one is the term preload, which is the pressure in the ventricles at the end of diastole. And I have volume in parentheses here because it's, the two are tied very closely together. But technically we're talking about the pressure in the ventricles and obviously the volume is going to affect that pressure. Afterload is the resistance against which the heart must pump. So when we think about preload and afterload, we're talking about how much pressure is coming into the heart, into the ventricles specifically. Afterload is how much pressure are those ventricles pushing against in order to successfully move blood forward. Both of these will affect stroke volume and both of these will affect cardiac output. So when we talk about cardiac output, we're talking about stroke volume times heart rate. So we mentioned preload, and the thing that's important to remember about preload is that it's the venous side that influences this most. It's the blood coming into the heart, and this can be directly impacted by things like fluid boluses. When we administer to a fluid to a patient, we're increasing preload, and we can do that strategically sometimes in cardiac situations. That preload, the amount of fluid, the amount of pressure, is going to determine how much volume there is. In diastolic volume is exactly that. It's the volume in the ventricle at the end of that relaxation phase. That's the maximum amount of fluid the heart has to work with when it goes to squeeze to move forward. The Frank Starling mechanism is an important concept here, and this is referred to in a lot of cardiac literature. Because what these docs, Frank and Starling, it's not one person, what these docs figured out was that if you stretch a muscle, it squeezes. If you stretch it more, it squeezes stronger. And there's a limit to that phenomenon, of course, but any increase in stretch increases cardiac output. This osmosis video captures sort of the essence of that pretty simply. And stretching out the cardiac muscle makes it contract with more force, which increases stroke volume during systole.
This is kind of like how stretching out a rubber band makes it snap back even harder. Except that cardiac muscle is actively contracting, whereas the rubber band is passively going back to its relaxed state. Afterload is that tension in the arterial walls that resists forward blood flow by the ventricles. This is one of the things we're noticing or we're thinking about when we're assessing high blood pressure in our patients, because this is also represents the minimum amount of pressure the heart must overcome. In other words, the minimum amount of work the heart has to do in order to move blood forward. That's also called peripheral vascular resistance. This is why we're looking at blood pressure in a variety of ways when we're assessing a cardiac patient. So we know that cardiac output times resistance is what the measurement of blood pressure is. And since we know that cardiac output is a combination of stroke volume and heart rate, what the three factors we really care about most in terms of what makes up a patient's blood pressure is the stroke volume, how much blood is in each in the ventricle each time it squeezes, how fast is the heart beating, and how much resistance is it working against. Now we know blood pressure is a great measure, it gives us a good view, but what's more critical in terms of especially critically ill patients is mean arterial pressure. If you've ever heard me lecture on patient assessment, you know that I think this is something we overlook a lot in EMS, and that is that mean arterial pressure is a ratio of between systolic and diastolic. And rather than doing the math with this formula, there's a much easier way to do it. If you're using an automated blood pressure machine, it'll give you the mean arterial pressure. And the reason that's significant is it really tells us whether or not the pressure is adequate to perfuse vital organs. And 60 millimeters of mean arterial pressure is the minimum to maintain brain perfusion in most patients, and about 70 is the minimum required to perfuse the kidneys. So the goal is typically, even in critical care, is to keep that patient well above 70, even if we're trying to maintain a permissive hypotensive to some extent, because we want to maintain adequate perfusion to those vital organs. So shift gears here for a second and talk about neurological control. We know that the medulla oblongata houses the cardiac control center essentially that takes the feedback, takes the input from various receptors and sensors and stimulates the heart to increase its output. And it does that through chronotropic, which is related to heart rate, inotropic, which is related to squeeze, or dromotropic effect. Dromotropic is a term that's not used as much. It actually refers to the speed of the trans electrical transmissions from one cell to the next. And obviously, if you speed up transmission, you speed up heart rate. So this, they definitely overlap each other, but that's what those terms refer to. If on the other hand, the body is sensing the need to slow things down to reduce the pressure, then the vagus nerve is triggered to put out that vagal tone to create that acetylcholine release to slow the heart rate. This is also how our vagal maneuvers work. So if we're trying to slow down a tachycardia, one way we can attempt to do that in very simple mechanical terms is a variety of techniques that are designed to stimulate the vagus nerve and cause that uh, release of acetylcholine and cause that slowing of the heart rate. The chemoreceptors that feed into this system are in the carotid artery and the aortic bodies and they sense changes in pH, change, sense changes in CO2, and in response to those changes they're going to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system to correct the imbalance depending on which way things need to move. Another quick reminder about properties of cardiac cells. Now, When we talk about the cardiac cells specifically and especially when we talk about the cells in the conduction system. These four properties are absolutely critical to understanding what's going on with cardiac cells that's very unique compared to any other cell in the body. One is automaticity. Automaticity is simply the ability to generate its own pulse. When we talk about the electrophysiology, we'll talk about the action potential and that transition from a resting potential to an action potential. And most cells in the body, even most cardiac cells, are sitting in a ready state waiting for a stimulus to make something happen. Cardiac cells, specifically cardiac conduction cells, pacemaker cells, are built in such a way that they are constantly, they never really have a resting potential. They never are truly at rest. They are in transition and they're automatically moving towards a state of depolarization all on their own. That's automaticity. The next property is conductivity and all cardiac cells uh, have this property of the ability to conduct an impulse, to receive an impulse, to transmit it, to change, and to pass that along to the next cell and that's critical for cardiac conduction. Excitability, which is that ability very closely related to conductivity. Excitability is just that 
ability to sit there in a ready state and respond when an impulse comes along. And the final one is contractility, and that's the ability to contract muscle fibers. Now, not all cardiac cells have that ability, but the vast majority of them do, which we'll talk about. So automaticity, conductivity, excitability, and contractility, those are the four critical properties of cardiac cells. When you combine all those together, you get this phenomenon known as a syncytium. Syncytium is a term that describes this ability of multiple cells, thousands of cells, to be able to work and function as a single unit. It's kind of unique in cardiac cells in the way that they combine and are joined both mechanically, electrically, and chemically, and the result is a coordinated contraction of the entire heart not just individual cells. And it happens in a way to most effectively squeeze essentially from the bottom towards the top in a twisting motion to empty the ventricles as effectively as possible with each contraction. All cardiac cells are especially permeable to potassium, calcium, and sodium. So when we talk about the ions, we talk about electrolytes, these are the three that we tend to talk about the most in cardiac medicine because they have the biggest role in cardiac dysrhythmias, in cardiac function, in alterations of those based on alterations of these electrolyte levels. Another property is in intercalated discs are specialized cellular membranes that are located at the branch junctions and gap junctions, which are areas within those discs which have a lower resistance to electrical impulses. Those structures contribute to the ability for electricity to move through incredibly quickly from one cell to the other to the next in a very coordinated fashion. To wrap this up, there's a two types of cardiac cells that we're going to differentiate between. And the first is the myocardial cells, obviously the muscle cells of the heart. And they make up 99% of the cells. So that's huge. You have to recognize that the vast majority of cells in the heart are muscle cells, meaning they contract, they squeeze, they create that forward blood flow uh, when they do. These are the muscle cells that we are going after with our inotropic medications. That's how we increase squeeze is by affecting those cells. They have a limited number of conduction characteristics. In other words, they're designed to squeeze and conduction is sort of a secondary component. However, they do have the ability to create impulses on their own, to conduct impulses from one cell to the next. They're just not wired that way primarily. The other type of cardiac cell that we will talk about quite a bit, especially when we're talking about ECG interpretation, is pacemaker cells. And these are the conductivity agents in the heart. These are cells that actually generate and conduct electrical impulses. This is that automaticity function. These are what drive our heartbeat and oftentimes drive dysrhythmias as well, but they do not contract. They have no myofibrils, they have no muscle structure to them, so they don't actually contribute. But again, they're only about 1% of the, of the cells in the heart, and they're found along the electrical conduction pathways that we identify when we're looking at our cardiac anatomy. They have a large number of gap out junctions, and they conduct impulses six times as fast as the muscle cells. And that's important because if you look at the cardiac structure, when we look at the electrophysiology, and the way the electricity moves through the heart, the electricity has to go from the top of the heart very rapidly to the bottom, so then it can trigger a contraction that essentially goes from the bottom of the heart back up towards the top. That's a really short overview of some key cardiac physiology issues. Next, we'll talk about electrophysiology and some of the factors that come to play there.